In the history of World War II, there are two distinct narratives about infantry rifles. On one side, we have the German St. G-44, the Sturmgewehr, the Storm Rifle. Historians and video games alike mythologize it as the grandfather of the AK-47 and the M-16, a technological leap that arrived too late to save the Third Reich. It is the heavy-hitting, fully automatic wonder weapon. On the other side, we have the American M1 carbine, a weapon often dismissed by Internet critics as a pea shooter, a glorified pistol, or a toy. It didn't look scary. It didn't have a pistol grip. It fired a round that some soldiers claimed, falsely, couldn't penetrate a frozen winter coat. But here is the uncomfortable truth that weapon enthusiasts often ignore. One of these guns was a maintenance nightmare that ran out of ammo and was abandoned in ditches. The other was a logistical masterpiece that armed six million men and allowed the Allies to overwhelm the Wehrmacht with a tsunami of fire. Today, we aren't just comparing stats. We are auditing the philosophy of war. It's the war baby versus the storm rifle. To understand these weapons, we have to look at the problems they were trying to solve. For Germany, the problem was a tactical crisis on the Eastern Front. The Wehrmacht entered the war with the Kar 98K, a bolt-action rifle designed for 800-meter engagements. Citation, German combat analysis from 1942 revealed that most infantry engagements actually took place under 400 meters. They were fighting Soviet troops armed with PPSH-41 submachine guns who were drowning them in volume of fire. The Germans needed a Goldilocks weapon, something with more range than an SMG, but a higher rate of fire than a bolt action. They developed the Maschinenkarabiner 42, which evolved into the MP43. And finally, thanks to Hitler's obsession with dramatic names, the STG-44. The Americans, however, were solving a logistical problem. In 1940, the U.S. Army realized a terrifying reality. Blitzkrieg moves fast. Rear echelon troops, truck drivers, artillerymen, cooks were going to be on the front lines. The standard M1 Garand was 9.5 pounds and long. The M1911 pistol was hard to shoot accurately past 20 yards. They needed a personal defense weapon, PDW, before that term even existed. Enter Winchester and the legendary David Carbine Williams. In a massive feat of engineering, Winchester developed the M1 Carbine in just 13 days. It wasn't designed to be an assault rifle. It was designed to replace the pistol. But it was so good, so light, and so reliable that frontline infantry stole them from the cooks. Let's talk about the metal. The St. G-44 was a child of desperation. German industrial capacity was crumbling under Allied bombing. They couldn't afford expensive milled steel, so they used metal stampings, sheets of steel pressed into shape and spot welded. It was ugly, industrial, and heavy. This heavy construction had a consequence. The STG-44 weighed over 11 pounds loaded. That is heavy. For context, a modern M4 carbine weighs about 7 pounds. The STG was a brick. The M1 carbine, conversely, was a featherweight masterpiece. It weighed just 5.2 pounds unloaded. You could hold it extended in one hand. Crucially, it utilized the short-stroke gas piston system disguised under the handguard. Citation, this is the same gas system used in the modern HK-416 and SCAR-17. The M1 carbine was actually more mechanically advanced than the St. G's tilting bolt system, which was older tech. But the STG had a fatal engineering flaw, the magazine. It was made of thin, stamped metal. If a soldier dropped it, the feed lips bent. If the feed lips bent, the gun jammed. 
German soldiers were instructed never to hold the gun by the magazine, a hard habit to break in combat. The M1's magazines were robust, cheap, and easily swapped. This is where the internet comments section usually turns into a battlefield. The ammo. The STG fired the 7.92 Kurds. It was the first true intermediate cartridge. It fired a 125-grain bullet at about 2,250 feet per second. It hit hard out to 400 meters. It was, undeniably, a better combat cartridge for open fields. The M1 fired the .30 carbine. Critics call it a pistol round. This is factually incorrect. Citation. Ballistics tests show the .30 carbine generates roughly 970 foot-pounds of energy at the muzzle. That is nearly double the energy of a .45 ACP fired from a Thompson. It is roughly equivalent to a .357 Magnum fired from a rifle barrel. So, where does the frozen coat myth come from? During the Korean War, soldiers reported shooting Chinese troops in heavy quilted coats and seeing them keep running. They blamed the bullet. Modern ballistics testing by the FBI and independent researchers has proven that .30 carbine zips through heavy clothing, drywall, and even level 2 body armor at 100 yards. The reality? The M1 carbine's sights were optimistic. At 200 yards, the bullet drops significantly. In the chaos of human wave attacks, frozen hands, and terror, soldiers were likely missing or hitting non-vital areas. The gun took the blame for the chaos of war. We often talk about stopping power, but we rarely talk about carrying power. Infantry warfare is 99% walking and 1% shooting. If you are clearing a house in Aachen or patrolling a jungle in the Pacific, do you want an 11-pound rifle that is front-heavy or a 5-pound rifle that snaps to your shoulder instantly? Audie Murphy, the most decorated American soldier of the war, preferred the M1 carbine. Why? Because the gun you have with you, and can aim quickly, is deadlier than the better gun that you left in the truck because it was too heavy. The STG-44 offered superior suppression, yes, but for the dynamic, fast-moving warfare of 1944, the M1 carbine's handling was superior. This is the final nail in the coffin for the STG-44's reputation as a war winner. Germany produced approximately 425,000 STG-44s. The United States produced over 6,100,000 M1 carbines. We built more carbines than M1 Garands. We built more carbines than the Germans had soldiers on the Western Front. This created a revolution in volume of fire. In a German unit, maybe the NCO had an MP40 and one or two guys had St. G's. The rest had bolt-action car 98s. In a U.S. unit, the officers, the mortar crew, the machine gunners, and the radio man all had semi-automatic carbines with 15-round magazines. If a German patrol bumped into a U.S. supply column, they weren't met with pistol fire. They were met with a wall of lead. The M1 carbine turned every single American soldier into a credible rapid-fire threat. That is a strategic victory that far outweighs the STG's ballistic advantage. So, let's render a verdict. If you are writing a history of technology, the STG-44 wins. It was the future. It defined the assault rifle class. It was the father of the AK-47. It was a visionary step forward. But if you are writing a history of victory, the M1 carbine takes the crown. It was the ultimate tool for its time. It was rugged, reliable, and produced in numbers that defy comprehension. It didn't try to be a wonder weapon. It tried to be a useful weapon. And in doing so, it became the most underrated small arm of the 20th century. But I want to hear from you. In a zombie apocalypse, 
or a trench in Bastogne, which one are you grabbing? The heavy hitter or the lightweight rapid fire? Let me know in the comments below. Make sure to like and subscribe. We'll see you in the next one. This is Microdocs. Thanks for watching.